Father, we thank you today for this moment that from all eternity in your sovereignty and your foreknowledge knew who would connect with the kingdom of God in this moment. The sobriety of your sacrifice, the sovereignty, and the power of your person is overwhelming in this house today. God, we ask that you would engrave with that nail-pierced invisible hand the power of your character and who you declared with your own lips that you were and are. God, let us be forever changed. Let miracles happen in this house today and to those that are watching from all over this nation. God, impact their lives. Just as you appeared to the disciples after your resurrection, God, appear and let your presence show up in an awesome way, in a way that will supply every need. You are our source, our God, our Savior, our healer, our strength, our shepherd. You are the gate. You are the way, the peace, the life. You are the vine. You are everything that we need, and we declare who you are in this house today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We are in our series, I Am Jesus. It's interesting when you navigate through the Word of the Lord how who He is and who He declared He would be begins to leap off the pages and wrap its way around your heart. Jesus said, I'm the door, I'm the gate, I'm the way, the truth, the life, the good shepherd, the vine, the light of the world. But the question I want to ask you today, have you ever prayed a prayer and you felt like God has not answered you? Do you deal with the future in moments of apprehension because past questions scream at you, trying to overshadow your faith with all the questions of why? We want to help you in this series and navigate through those moments of life because in this passage of Scripture, we're in John chapter 11, verse 22 through 25. Lazarus has passed away. Mary and Martha have sent word to Jesus. We find that Mary is depressed. Lazarus dies. Thomas is freaked out. And now Martha is mad. This is the same family that invited Jesus over every time he was in town supported his ministry. This is the same group of people that had an internal struggle because Mary, who is staying at home, is the one that sat at his feet, and now she's dealing with discouragement. Let me just share with you, you can pray hours a day, but if you don't mix it with faith, you're going to find yourself struggling with delay, discouragement, believing it's denial. Verse 22, John chapter 11. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. I wish we could park right there just for a while because Jesus shows up and we find that Lazarus' sister comes and says, even though my brother is dead, even now I know. How many of you today need an even now? Things have happened to you things you're struggling with, things that are chasing you, things that are confronting you, but there is enough faith in your heart to know the character of God to say, even now I know. Verse 23, Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at that last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. So let me ask you a question today because we want to chart a course through the scenario and the challenges and the struggles that Mary and Martha are faced with as Jesus begins to insert who he is into the midst of this catastrophic situation, even in the midst of delays, even in the midst of 
watching what he has done, and now they are confronted with their own traumatic experience, I want to ask you today, is there anything in your life that seems to be dead, dried up? Do you feel like you're stuck, or are you positioned? Do you believe that he still is the resurrection and the life? Well, I will accept that. John chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. Let me set you a background for what is happening. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. Bethany means the house of bread. So whatever happens to you, if you live under the canopy of the bread of life, then nothing can happen to you that God can't help you through. What he doesn't deliver you from He will walk through with you. Verse 2, this is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Are you in that situation today where you need an even now? Is there somebody close to you? that is very ill, or are you struggling in your marriage or in relationships? Maybe there is a friendship that you used to have, and they've deleted you on Facebook, and you try to text them, and even though they deleted you, you see the bubbles, and you know they're listening and watching what you're texting to them, and the frustration mounts. Help me, somebody. And so we find ourselves in a situation, maybe your teens are in trouble. There's a lot of young people that are in trouble today because they're being fed misinformation in the world and sometimes in the church because our obligation is not to be their friend and not to make them feel better, but to help them find Jesus and have an experience with him that will transform their life forever so that when we are gone and are sitting in the feet of Jesus somewhere in eternity and enjoying the presence of God, they will pick up the baton and run the race with patience. You see, Jesus waited in verse 4. He waited for two days, and this was his friend. It's amazing to me in John chapter 11 and verse 4, but when Jesus heard about it, he said about Lazarus' death, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. The King James says it's not a sin unto death or it's not a sickness unto death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Can I challenge you today, even in the midst of your even now, Lord, I know that he can extract glory and honor from your situation. Are you willing to surrender everything in your life to him that no matter what happens, he gets all the glory and he gets all the honor? Because God wants to extract every event of our life so that the world looks unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. Sometimes in retrospect, we look back and we see how that nail-pierced invisible hand guided us through trauma, through challenges, through struggles, through overwhelming issues that we thought we would never survive. How will we come out of this? How will we ever stand again? How can I ever exercise faith again? And yet, if we would just lean on him and know that there are some things he wants to do in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our trauma, in the midst of everything that is apprehensive, in the midst of the chaos of our culture and the darkness of our world, when it looks like everything is being flushed, I'm telling you, God is not done. Can I tell you what the Lord spoke to me a week ago? He said, son, I do my best work in darkness. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the earth, and God said, it's in darkness, it's in chaos, it's in the midst of everything where you don't see accurately or clearly that our surrender to him can activate his power, his light, his favor, his wisdom, his strength, his rest, his healing, his freedom, his deliverance. We're watching God as we partner together in faith. And those of you that are watching today, we'll pray over prayer cloths and send them to you. We just need for you to let us know. There's nothing magical about a prayer cloth. It's just our obedience and our faith 
Why God instituted that through the Apostle Paul, I'm not sure, but it is an avenue through which the anointing of God can touch a person's life because the presence of God or the anointing of God is tangible. You can feel it. You can sense it. It's powerful. It's tangible, and it's powerful, and it has the ability to transform people's lives. We are changed by the Spirit of God from glory to glory into His image. It's not really a shift. We're going from faith to faith, strength to strength, and victory to victory. But you can't have victory if you don't have a battle. And you don't have a battle if there's not conviction, and there's no conviction if there's not confrontation. And there's never confrontation if you don't know what the Word says. You can't exercise faith if you don't know what your platform of confidence in God's ability And yet this family, Martha and Mary and Lazarus, he had struggled with this sickness. Jesus waited. He delayed in his coming on purpose. Is it possible in the midst of your challenge and the midst of your crying out to God that the Lord is waiting to step into the midst of your difficulty and of your struggle at the right time and the enemy attempts to take advantage of your vulnerability? In the midst of a moment when you think it's over, nothing's going to happen. My brother has already experienced death. And Jesus makes the statement to his disciples, this is not a sickness unto death. I'm wondering if his disciples are looking at him because Thomas is going to freak out and he's going to step up to the plate and go, let's all go die with him. (laughs) He speaks out of inexperience and out of a lack of an understanding of the character of Jesus. Because Jesus will stand at the tomb. Come on. What dead issue in your life do you need to invite Jesus in and allow him up to the grave of your situation so that he can declare, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I still believe that he makes dead things come back to life. He is the restorer of of paths to walk in. He is able to take us who are dead in trespasses and sins and cause us to be alive unto him. Amen. And we don't always act like it. We ch- are challenged with the daily routine of monotony. But if you will awaken your spirit every day and say, Lord, I am alive unto you and dead to the world. Today we don't gather encumbered with the pleasures of life or the cares of this world. We gather today to worship God because he is still the first and the last. He is still the sovereign God who created the universe, who threw the planets into their existence and in their orbit. He is still able to take your life and give it substance, give it destiny, give it purpose in the midst of everything that is beating against your life saying it's dead. Hallelujah. So how do we do this? How do we navigate this? How did Jesus take them from this point of extreme trauma and overwhelming grief to a place of great rejoicing where Lazarus will come and sit at a meal in the book of John a few chapters later and the Pharisees will recognize that he is the one that was dead? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we walked through our community and people looked at us and didn't say, well, they go to that church, but they would say, I remember when they were dead in their sins and trespasses, and now they're alive unto God. But we have a tendency to put titles and certifications of certain religious background and theology over our life, like an individual I spoke to on the phone this week. And uh, they said, Pastor, we just want you to know. And then they named their denomination. And I went, that's okay, because it doesn't mean anything to God. God did not create a denomination. He built the church. And he gave it a solid foundation, the prophets to, that are, are the stones of the foundation, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. How do I get through my challenge? How do I get through my difficulty? Some people look to the things of the world to find temporary fulfillment. But I tell you, when everything looks like it's been lost and you're up against a wall and the cold granite of darkness without feeling begins to cause a mourning to rise up within you and doubt begins to overshadow you. I want to challenge you that we can stand in the midst of what Jesus did because I want to ask you, are you at a dead end today? 
Do you feel like the turns you've made in your life has brought you down the street and you didn't notice the sign when you turned at the last highway? Dead end street, no exit. Do you feel like you've come to a dead end? I've had many dead ends in my life because I didn't follow the Holy Spirit and I followed my own way and I thought this would be a better road and it looked like a shortcut and it was a dead end, no exit. How do we, how do we navigate that? How do we deal with that? Let's go to John chapter 11 and verse 16. Are you dead in your doubts? Have your doubts so overwhelmed you that it has caused you to be a corpse in your faith? Has rigor mortis set in to where you're not even able to worship anymore? Because worship is an atmosphere that attracts the sovereign God that brings his power into the midst of every situation. Just air hug somebody and just tell them if you're not listening, you should. (laughs) Verse 16 of John chapter 11. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. What is Thomas known for? It didn't just begin after the resurrection. It began early in his walk with the Lord. But just so that you know, Thomas wasn't always a doubter. He found himself preaching the gospel in India and was killed and martyred for the sake of the gospel. Something happened in his life. You do not have to stay on a dead-end road. You do not have to park there, build a condo, camp out, and get a sterno stove and have an old leftover uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken bowl that you bought from the salvage store. But some of us have parked at that arena in our life because God didn't do what we thought he should do. And yet we were not willing to exercise our faith in any way, form, or fashion. We forgot who he said he was, and we allowed rigor mortis to set in to our life when we once had a vibrant faith and a vibrant worship and a passionate prayer life, and all of a sudden we're struggling from day to day, which in my opinion should be nonsense in the New Testament church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is enough power. If he is really the resurrection and the life, I was going to say this later, but I feel it now. If he really is the resurrection and the life, every time we lift our hands and worship him, whether we're at home at the beginning of the day, no matter where we are, especially when we come together, should we not see the manifest power of resurrection begin to move in our life if he really is who he says he was and we believe that? Every time I worship God, I begin to declare, God, I thank you that you're the resurrection and the life. Anything around me that's dead, I refuse to allow rigor mortis to set in. I refuse to be a corpse that used to believe, but now I'm on a dead-end street. Jesus knows how to handle your doubts. You ever have spiritual doubts? No, don't be holy on me now. We've all had spiritual doubts. Haven't you ever faced a walled city, or a doctor's diagnosis, or a pink slip from work, and you wonder, God, are you, are you really there? We have those moments. Those moments are not going to stop because you're living for Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit. They come. They can blindside you. They can attack you. Some of you that are struggling sleeping at night and feel like you're walking in a fog, it's just the spiritual demonic atmosphere trying to clog your faith and cause you to be a corpse instead of a lively stone. He is the resurrection and the life. You ever prayed and fasted and didn't seem like anything happened? Faith wasn't but probably a year or two old. I felt so strong that the Lord spoke to me that if I would pray and fast for three days that he would heal her. So I did. There was no change. But I've learned this, that it doesn't matter what he instructs me to do. Only my obedience is what is required. Now, I didn't lose my faith in God's ability to touch her life. Because if we would turn her loose as you're all exiting, 
our offering would increase by about two to three hundred dollars because she knows how to pick your pocket and you'll never know that her little skinny hand has reached down in your pocket and extracted. I'm going to now teach her how to get a credit card and run it through our We have to take every situation, we have to take every test and know that it's going to become a testimony. We have to know that everything that we face, if we invite Jesus Christ in the middle of it, he can bring life and strength and power into all of it. Now we're going to pray, we've prayed for some people that have had cancer and I want to make this statement again. Some of you have lost friends, loved ones from cancer and I don't have an answer for you today except that eternity is real. And we don't always have a choice on how we exit this life, but we're seeing people healed and, uh, of cancer and, and various sicknesses and diseases. Some people are looking back at, at COVID, and I've got friends that are still saying, that was a horrible year. No, it wasn't. It was a year where the church moved ahead. If we refused to become a corpse and we became a lively stone. Because it doesn't matter what happens around us. Can I just share something with you? Uh, how many of you would, would be willing to agree with me that in America we're spoiled? Okay. The statistic a few years ago said if you make more than $30,000 a year, you're in the upper 10% of wealthiest people in the world. Put that in perspective. Okay. So he knows how to deal with our doubts. Maybe you were in high school. Maybe you have a teenager in high school and they're doing well and they're involved in FCA and a variety of activities. And all of a sudden we go to college and they're bombarded with everything you can imagine from God is dead to situation ethics, which we were inundated with in 1974 in a Christian college. Situation ethics says that there's no absolute. It just depends on the situation you're in. But God is absolute, and he's true. And he has grace, and he has mercy, and he has the ability to help us at every situation. What happened in the midst of Thomas's doubts? He will be there. He will make the journey from Bethany to where Lazarus is and stand there at the tomb, and his doubts will be shattered as they roll the stone back and Lazarus comes hopping out of the tomb. Where is it that you need something dead to come to life today? I'm not talking about fantasy. I'm not talking about an emotional wish, wish list. I'm talking about real faith, God's promises, things that he has set before us, and we're moving in that direction, and the enemy is doing everything he can to hinder you, to resist you, to stop you, and today you're becoming alert what the enemy is trying to do, and you're making a declaration over the powers of darkness that the God that you serve is the way, the truth, the life. He is the strength, the good shepherd, the resurrection, and the life. He's all that you need. The second thing is this in John chapter 11 and verse 20. Are you dead in discouragement? Have you become a hopeless, rigor mortis person of constantly being discouraged? Will happiness ever come in my life? Will I ever have a baby? Will I ever get married? Will I ever have a child? Will anything ever change in my life? Will I ever have a good relationship? Maybe you're discouraged today and say, man, I'm just failing as a parent. I'm in a dead-end job and my dream is dead and nothing is happening. Do you understand that our churches in America are filled with people that are dead in their doubts and dead in their discouragement? And they go to church and they drag themselves there because they don't want to go to hell and they know that God is able to do things, but they don't believe that he'll do it for them. Can I tell you that he's no respecter of persons? And if you will arise and, uh, and, and shine, the glory of God will begin to come upon you. If you'll begin to reignite that which you know is true, the foundation of your faith should be that he is the resurrection and the life. He is able. If you all can do a favor for me and listen attentively, because when you sit and talk, it disturbs everybody else around you. So you become an offense to God. Hello? Hello? You become an offense to God. When you hinder somebody else from hearing the word that would set them free, you're becoming a tool of the enemy. I love you today. You say, well, I don't like you anymore. Get in line, get a number. 
but we're going to believe in this house that God brings dead things to life. And there is a sobriety of the Holy Ghost that is coming in a fear of the Lord that people will no longer be able to come in and ignore the Holy Spirit. That's why they have to do all kinds of different things that I'm not going to list because I'm not into that. But whenever we become a distraction to somebody else, you become an offense to God. Then you pray and you wonder why God's not answering your prayers. And the Holy Spirit will speak to you and say, Remember what I spoke Sunday morning? No, sir, I don't, because I was talking to the person next to me because it was so critical that I talked to them about where we're going to lunch and about the, the callus on the bottom of my foot and the doctor's appointment that I have on Wednesday morning. Well, if you'd been listening, God might have healed you, and so when you went to the doctor, you'd get a good report instead of getting a bad report, and then you want to come to church and you want to hear everything and you want my attention, you want us to pray for you. Now, that was added today. It doesn't cost you anything extra. There'll be no bonus in my check. Are you at a dead-end street? Are you dead in your doubts or dead in your discouragement? Are you living in that place where you just feel like nothing is moving forward? We've all been there. We've all experienced that at some point in our life. Deb and I had to make up our minds years ago. In fact, it was when we took faith to uh, St. John's Hospital in Springfield or Memorial Hospital, and they looked at Faith and said, sir, I'm sorry, but your daughter is dead uh, blind and has degenerate brain disease. Deb ran out of the hospital screaming, and I'm left holding this little baby that we named Faith, looking into her eyes that are glassy and milky and cannot see us. Here's the declaration that we made on the way home. God, I just want to thank you that you are everything that we need. We name this young girl Faith, and we are going to continue to believe. I'm going to continue to preach healing. I'm going to continue to preach giving. I'm going to continue to walk in faith. I'm going to continue to make strong declarations and hold fast my confession of faith because you have a purpose for her in the midst of performing a miracle. Every day we make this declaration, God, I declare a creative miracle from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. I declare that everything in the speech center, the motor skills of her brain are, causing, are, are coming back to life, are functioning correctly and accurately. That's why now she's become our stealth baby. We put bells on her door. Now she sneaks out and we can't hear her. So we do what any good parent would do with a child that gets up in the middle of the night. We leave her peanuts and a drink on the tabletop of the counter in the kitchen. You can allow anything in your life to take you under, but nothing can overpower the strength, the peace, the purpose, the destiny of the will of God. Peace is not just a characteristic of God. Peace is the reality of the power of his presence. Some of you today are not walking in peace. You hear me preach every week, and yet peace seems to elude to elude you because you don't make the decision. I wonder if there are people that are more comfortable being a corpse than being a lively stone. You say, I'm just waiting for the power of God to come upon me. Why don't you lift up your hands and open your mouth and say, God, I thank you for everything that you are. I thank you that you're the first and the last. You saved me. You dug me out of a horrible pit. Your blood reaches to the highest mountain, to the lowest valley. There's no demon spirit in hell, no assignment in hell, no curse, no generational curse, no demonic assignment that can hinder me, stop me, resist me. I'm going to get through this, over this, around this, under this. I know that you're for me and not against me, and all things are working together for the good of them who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. I will not stay in delay or discouragement. I will move forward in Jesus' name. Air hug somebody and tell them you needed that. Number three, are you dead in delay? Have you prayed something that hasn't come to pass? Are you becoming weary in well-doing? Are you becoming weary in the, the normal aspects of religious Christian discipleship? Are you becoming weary and maybe you're not seeing everything begin to come together? Let me take you to John chapter 11 and verse 17. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, the house of bread, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. It's too late. Would have been nice if you would have been here. That's passive-aggressive. If you just would have been here, 
my brother would not have died. Look at verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. (laughs) Didn't understand. But she's like many of us that get stuck on a dead-end street. And Jesus wants to prove himself powerful in our life. So we have these delays. Anybody ever going to love me without wanting something in return? Is anybody ever going to befriend me and not want what I have to offer? Are they just going to love me because of who I am? Delays in our life. Let me just tell you that God's delays are not God's denials. Delay is not denial if you won't quit, if you won't give up, if you don't turn into a corpse. Let me just make a general statement from churches that I have visited. I have been in some of those powerful worship services uh, in some places where I have preached, and I have watched people sit there and not be moved, and I'm thinking, God, I'm not mad. Lord, don't let them miss a moment when you can bring life into their heart, whatever they're facing, whatever they're struggling with. You don't have to be a spiritual gymnastic. You don't have to be a jumper or a leper or leaper. <laughs> but I think that if the living one is within us, there should be some kind of element of life in us. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to get to the house of God. And when this, these musicians and these singers hit this platform, I'm ready to go. There's something in my spirit that's ready to touch God because I know in that moment what is trying to come against me cannot stand against what is already in me. For ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. For greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The problem is, in the American church, we have been so accustomed to certain routines and cycles. I wonder if God was sitting in heaven and calling Gabriel and Michael and saying, listen, just want you to know you're going to get a lot busier. So tell all of those that are under your authority because this thing called COVID is going to come out of China and everybody's going to be upset. It's going to shut the church down. Then the church is going to be divided and they're going to hate one another about who wears a mask, who doesn't wear a mask. And then they're going to get mad about who gets a vaccine, who doesn't get a vaccine. Then all of this thing is going to come, and some of them are going to start preaching hellfire, and some of them are going to be scared that I'm coming quickly, but this isn't the tribulation. But you need to help me because the church is trying to get positioned to do what I've called them to do 2,000 years ago and the sacrifice that I paid. If they'll begin to embrace that, maybe this will alert them. Maybe this will uh, cause them to arise and be shaken out of their doubts, their discouragements, and their delays, and they'll no longer be a corpse but a lively stone. Hallelujah. It's interesting because Mary, Mary in Luke chapter 10 is the one that was sitting at the feet of Jesus, and yet the Bible says in verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming to comfort them concerning their brethren, As soon as she heard that Jesus was coming and went and met him, but Mary stayed in the house. It is the time now for what we believe to be put into practice. Because if we don't practice it, we really don't believe it. You only know what you're willing to practice. If you really believe he inhabits the praises of your people, then I would take advantage of the next opportunity you have, whether it's at home, in the car. I love worshiping in the car because nobody judges me about whether I'm off key, whether I'm too loud, whether I'm too soft, and I can crank my music as loud as I want it. And I can pull up next to a young kid in his new Challenger who's got this big bass speaker in his trunk. I've got two of them, so I just turn it up. And I'm going to overshadow whatever's making him depressed, whatever's challenging him. You see, it's a joy to serve God. And when you find out you you hit a dead-end road in doubt or discouragement or delays, immediately you confront with your Holy Spirit GPS, and he knows how to get you out, and he knows how to return you to the regular path. He knows how to restore the time that you've lost. 
so that you can accomplish all that he has purposed. In John chapter 11 in verse 22, but I know that even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to you. Can I tell you today, if you're lonely, he's a comforter. If you're confused, he can be your peace. If you're in financial distress, he's your provider. If you have a broken family, he's the restorer. If you've made mistakes, he's the giver of life. If you have been cold towards God, he is the one that can soften your heart. If you find yourself uh, uh, in a dead-end road, he is the resurrection and the life. He is able to bring life back into you. And I believe that God is attempting to bring life back into the church and we're beginning to see it happen in specific places. The church is a place, if Jesus is here, then there's life, power, faith, strength, wisdom, miracles, because wherever he went, he destroyed distributed and displayed all of those characteristics. Let me give you number four. The resurrection is not an event. It's a person. The resurrection is not just a moment in church history where we come together on Easter or Passover and we celebrate Jesus rising from the dead. Every day is a celebration. And if we can celebrate him every day, then every day you will see the power of the Holy Spirit involve itself in your life and re-guide you into a place of fruitfulness, of purpose, of destiny. All of a sudden you become alert to the people that are around you and you want to interact with them. God may give you a word for somebody, just a word of encouragement, because people look sad today. I used to love to go to the mall while my wife would shop at Joanne Fabrics for hours and hours. I never could understand why you need to look at a pattern for hours. So instead of complaining, which obviously I haven't stopped, I used to watch people. And Deb would come out of Joanne Fabrics, and I would go, people are so depressing. They don't look like they have any joy. They don't look like they have any peace in their life. The only thing they get encouraged about is when they come out of a particular store and it's time to eat. It seems like they perk up when they feed their belly. And some of them, what they need is they need to bypass and fast a little bit and deny themselves so that the power of God could be seen in their life. Maybe Mary and Martha in verse 23 uh, and 26 uh, of John chapter 11, Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Look at verse 26. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Can I tell each one of you, those of you that are here at New Life, those of you that are watching online, do you believe? That he is the resurrection and the life, and he is able to get out of you, get you out of your dead ends of doubts, delays, and discouragements. The resurrection is not an event; it is a person. I want to take you down to verse forty-three and uh, forty-four of John chapter eleven. There is more that we could share with you, but we, we wanted to target these things. Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus. He commanded that the stone be rolled away, and he said, Lazarus, come out. I wonder if it's possible that today Jesus is declaring somebody's name, and today you come out of the dead end of doubts, the dead end of discouragement, and the dead end of delays, and you see the hand of God move supernaturally. I hope we still believe in the miraculous and the supernatural power of God. Because I have a young lady sitting on the front row that was totally healed last Sunday morning when we prayed over a cloth. She put that cloth on her belly. She's not had. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Even now, Lord, I know. The word know is intimate knowledge of. It's genosco. 
intimate knowledge. Even now, I understand and know within everything in my being that you are able to do what I need for my life. In verse 43, he, the Bible says in the King James that he shouted. The word shouted there is mega. He declared with a loud voice. Can I tell you today, don't ever be afraid to get in your prayer closet and speak to your problem loudly. Declare to your dead issue loudly. God will not be frightened. God will not be nervous. Hallelujah. You will not upset him. God is not, uh, and I don't even want to name a, a denomination because I would get in trouble. He is not a part of a group of people that is dead, dull, and boring, and, and, and they don't know how to get his attention. Have you ever had to call your children to you, and so you named their name, and nothing happened? They pretended they were deaf, and so you raised the level of your voice one more time, and they still didn't pay attention? So then you had to say, Faith Catherine, come back here. And all of a sudden, you got their attention, and then your child looks at you and goes, why do you yell at me all the time? No, no, I wanted your attention because we're going to pray for your deafness. We're going to take authority over this spirit of ignoring. God, don't let us ignore that still small voice that speaks to us, that wants to give us direction and insight with a mega voice. If Jesus can defeat death, then he can defeat anything. If he can defeat death, then he can defeat anything. No matter what you're walking through, no matter what you're challenged with, there is a spirit of fear that is rolling over this nation and over this world. And some of you spend too much time on CNN, constant negative news. I don't watch news anymore. Sometimes I'll have a, a feed that will come up and I'll, I'll be attracted by what's happening. But if we, if we listen too much to the news, then the good news becomes secondary. Don't let worldly news become first place. Let the good news become the primary motivation of your life that will move you and strengthen you and cause you to move from a corpse to a lively stone. How many of you have things happening in your life that you would prefer not to deal with? If I had my way, if I had my wish, I wouldn't deal with this. I don't want to deal with this. But you can't ignore it. It's there. So we either confront it with faith or we confront it with what I call a lukewarm attitude that says, well, God's got this. Really? That's a real simple way of just saying, I quit. I give up because I don't have enough word in me to exercise faith or confess what he has declared. But I think that you have enough of the word of God in you that you know what to confess, you know what to declare. So hold fast the profession of your faith. If you don't know what to declare over a situation, get a Strong's Concordance. Look up a word, find it, and say, God, I'm going to hang on to this word. Do you know the word that I hang on to every day for this little girl over here who will be 30 years old? Isaiah 54, verse 14. All thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Doesn't mean they won't go through struggles. Doesn't mean they won't go through problems. Doesn't mean they won't face difficulties and challenges. But it does mean that somebody is standing strong in the holy place and saying, God, I'm not quitting, I'm not giving up. Until she takes her final breath, I will declare every day healing, wholeness, supernatural intervention, a creative miracle. As long as there is breath, that's why the psalmist said, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Why? Because when we praise the Lord, we activate the resurrection power of a risen Savior that can come into our dead-end streets of doubts, delays, and discouragement and turn us around. Maybe. I wonder what would happen 
on the jobs of America and in the businesses of America if every single person sitting in the church pews of America would get a hold of this and say, you know what? I'm a lively stone. I'm not a corpse. I may feel like I'm at a dead end, but God is able to reroute me. I think businesses would turn upside down and wonder, what kind of employees do I have? That's the kind of employees I want. Or you can sit back and go, well, God's never done anything for me. That's right. I forgot. You're unique. You lost the lotto spiritually. God doesn't do anything for you. Hasn't ever done anything for you. You've never even won at bingos, horseshoes, or pig playing basketball. But what he did do for you is he laid down his life on Calvary's cross. He was mocked ridiculed, abandoned, rejected. He was pierced with a sword and outflowed blood and water so that you could be born again of the blood and of the water and of the Spirit. He was, he was scourged on his back so that you could have access to healing. Please don't ever come around me and tell me that God's not ever done anything for you. You felt the cool waters of baptism flow over your face while he eradicated all of your sin, cast them behind his back, covered you with the blood, did a spiritual operation in your heart, touched your life, is ready to do miracles in your life. Oh, don't take that posture today because you could miss it. Don't go home a corpse today. Tell yourself, I'm going home as a lively stone today. I'm going to praise God in the face of adversity, in the face of struggles, because my God is a miracle working, all powerful light in the darkness. He'll make a way where there is no way. He's for me and not against me. He's above, and I am seated in heavenly places with Him, and I declare that I am the conqueror. I am the victor because of who lives within me, and it doesn't matter what comes against me. Don't feel sorry for me. Don't tell me you're praying and thinking about me. Stand in agreement and declare the Word of God and declare today we will make it through this because our God is the resurrection and the life. He makes a way where there is no way and the wall that is in front of me, I'm going to lift my voice with a mega shout and declare that those walls are falling today. Fear, discouragement, depression, sickness, disease, cancer. In Jesus' name, I'm seated in heavenly places with Him. Hallelujah. 20 years ago, I'd have taken off running, but I can't. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you're watching today, we want to pray for you. We want to pray for a young girl by the name of Ellie who is in Memphis Hospital. She's been diagnosed with cancer of the brain and of the spine. And we're going to declare today the power of God is going to be released, Acts 19, 11, and 12. Paul took pieces of his clothing and aprons, and they prayed over it, and they were sent out. The Bible says this, many were healed and delivered of demon spirits. Can I tell you that fear is a demon spirit? I'm abhorring cancer. I hate cancer. And it seems as though in our culture, every time I turn around, somebody's being diagnosed with cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's, diabetes. And we're going to declare today, Ellie, that the power of God and the Spirit of the Lord is coming upon you in that hospital in Memphis. And when you receive this, lay it upon your physical body. Because the gentleman we prayed for in Florida who had pancreatic cancer, hadn't eaten for five days, watched the service online later, and all of a sudden his appetite rose up, Pastor Brad. He hadn't eaten for five days. Then he decided he wouldn't wear it anymore. Are you hearing me? And all of a sudden he began to digress. And he decided, I need to wear this thing because people have exercised their faith and they've prayed over this. Come on, it's not a magical tool. We're not asking for anything. We just ask that you would believe with us and that if you are the one that is inflicted with sickness, believe with us today because we believe he's the resurrection and the life. We believe he was wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon him and by his stripes, you're healed. He went back to the doctor and the doctors have been so amazed that they say now 
we believe we can do surgery and get rid of the rest of the cancer. With pancreatic cancer, that's unheard of. I am telling you, God is up to something and I am looking for him to show up in a powerful way in your life today. Would you stand with me? We're gonna pray. Pastor Brad, come. Pastor Aaron, Sarah, come. Let's pray over this. If you have a prayer need, please let us know. Send it to us. We wanna pray for you. We wanna agree in faith with you. Those of you that are standing with us today, you say, well, why aren't you praying over a cloth for me? Let me know, we will. But here's something I've learned. Maybe you need to exercise your faith today while things are going well. Because Ephesians 6, 8 says, what you cause to happen for others, God will do for you. And all of a sudden, you go to the doctor and they say something or something happens on the job and God goes, you know what? They exercise their faith when praying for this incredible need. We're gonna take care of what's happening in their life. Amen. If you don't know what to pray, then just speak the name of Jesus because there's power in that name. The Bible says that demons believe and tremble at the sound of that name. You want to get rid of fear and apprehension and anxiety and sickness and disease? Begin to declare the name of Jesus. Listen to me carefully. Not Yeshua. That's the Hebrew name. I hear people that know how to call him Yeshua Adonai, but they never speak the name of Jesus. And that concerns me because his name is far above everything that can be named. So we declare today over Ellie's life, over this brain cancer, over this cancer in her spine, we come against the moment that that cancer accessed her body in whatever area physically that was vulnerable and we block it and we declare and curse that cancer today in the name of Jesus and we declare to that spirit of cancer the Lord rebuke you and the blood of Jesus is against you. Let the power of your presence, Jesus, and of your person come upon her in that Memphis hospital in this moment. Let the power of peace, let strength, let the power of the Holy Spirit come upon her because men and women in this sanctuary and watching online are standing and praying in agreement. You said if two or three would agree as touching you on anything they'll ask of their father, it shall be done. And God, we're believing you today. And we call for everything in her body to be restored. Any damage this cancer has done, we ask for restoration. We ask God for a turnaround, a reversal of the diagnosis. Let doctors be amazed. Let them be confounded. Let them not understand what has happened. But God, today we know and we exalt the name of Jesus against this cancer because Lord you've exalted your word above your name and so God we take the word of the Lord and say Lord you heal us you are our healer Father I ask today that you would heal some internal issues in Ellie's life struggles that she has had emotionally struggles that she has had with historical reference points of her past. God, let the weightiness of your spirit break every generational curse, every demonic assignment. In the name of Jesus Christ, we declare healing and liberty and freedom over her life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you need prayer today, you need somebody to stand in agreement with you, we want to pray for you this morning. What? Oh, okay. We want to pray for a lady who's having lung issues and uh, another lady who is being overwhelmed physically and spiritually. Um, just take a hold of that. Let, let me say something to some of you. Some of you are struggling, sleeping at night. You're restless. It is your spirit that is hungry for the presence of God 
to navigate through what the enemy's trying to bring against you. The enemy knows if he can cause a fog or a heaviness or a lethargy over your life and he can stop you from doing what you know, he will capture you and cause you to be stuck. But I'm declaring today that if that's you, you're not stuck. Your position, you may be at a dead end, but Jesus is about to reroute you this morning. Father, I thank you for this individual that has requested prayer. And we stand against every demonic assignment, the spiritual warfare over her life. We cancel the things that are attacking her mind, the thoughts that are inundating her and ruling over her spirit, creating apprehension and depression. We declare by the blood of Jesus broken this morning in Jesus' name. You give life. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We delight ourselves in you, God, and you grant us the desires of our heart. We thank you this morning. We praise you today. We worship you that freedom and deliverance and liberty is flowing from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. The fogginess is disappearing. If that's happening to you, grab a hold of that now and say, God, that's mine. I'm going to walk in clarity. I'm going to walk in insight. I'm going to walk in strategic uh, elements and components that you're downloading in my heart. We call her healed today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Can I just pray for you? How many of you are facing things today you'd prefer not to? You didn't count on it. You didn't see it coming. You wish you wouldn't have had to deal with it. How many of you are facing things because you've just grown accustomed to it and you said that's just how life is? I'm calling you out of it today. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for these great men and women. If you're watching right now and you need to give your life to Jesus, we're going to pray in just a moment. But some of you are caught up in this fog of discouragement and delay. You're caught up in this fog and you can't move forward and you're just saying, I guess that's just the way life is. Uh, We're come to draw a sword against that. We've come to tell you that's not how life is supposed to be. Lord, we just ask today, as we take every thought captive into the obedience of Christ and your Lordship and the power of your name, Lord, we declare we're coming out of the wilderness. We're coming out of our lethargy. We're coming out of those things that have tried to entrap us. We're coming out of a dead-end street. We're coming out. We're a voice and a light to this culture and to this world. And we thank you for the power of your strength, the power of your purpose, the power of your love upon our lives. We thank you that even now, that the weightiness of your presence is crushing every demonic stronghold. In Jesus' name. If you've never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you've just straight away, you've wandered off, gone down a path. And today, you want to come back into the Father's house. And somewhere in your life, maybe you heard about Jesus. Maybe your grandmother took you to church. Maybe you had an experience, but something's happened. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. We're going to pray with you this morning. If you're in this house, we want to encourage you. Let's follow Jesus with all of our heart. Let's connect with God. Let's connect with the church. Let's connect with one another. Pray this with me right now. Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I'm a sinner that needs a Savior. I open my heart to you. Forgive me of all my sins from the day I was born till this moment. I ask for Calvary's victory, the power of the blood that you shed for me today. I receive it. I declare I'm forgiven. I'm healed. I have breakthrough in my life all because of you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that, let us know. We want to put something in your hand. We want to help you successfully follow Jesus. And before I let you go, you need to turn to somebody today and tell them, I am not a corpse. I'm a lively stone. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you. We thank God for you. Walk in victory. Walk in freedom. Walk in liberty. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit this week. Impact somebody's life. In Jesus' name.